And I just want us to remember that and carry that into this evening. That that call that we heard and that message of beckoning that that stands for now too. He's calling us to get out of our comfort zones. He's calling us to something new. He's calling us to something deeper with him. So let's just worship with everything within us. Heart, soul, mind.
We worship you, Lord. There's nothing like the name of Jesus. 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 Pray that the fear inside 
in your name. Thank you, Lord. Church, how true is it? Can't get any truer. Welcome tonight. Um, I want to thank you ladies for letting me, Ken, and Ivan be a part of the ladies' meeting tonight. Um, thank you very much. Well, just be real. I mean, where's the fellas at? I don't know. Just, you know call you guys out. So, um, Am I too loud? Do I sound too loud? Am I okay? Okay. Um, remember, we've got some people that are out sick tonight. Uh, we've got some that are traveling. So uh, remember those in prayer tonight, those that aren't here tonight. We, we are a little light this evening, but it's good to have everyone here this evening. So, But God is good, amen, and he is our hope. He is our hope, and, and Alyssa nailed it. I don't know about you, but those are the type of services you go home and you go, <laughs> and you just pass out. I didn't get a chance to pass out, but those are the type of services. But those are the type of services that we have, church. I heard somebody say, we had church this morning. I think it was Carly. We had church this morning, and we had an encounter. And listen, there are going to be those times where the Lord's going to just say, I've got this. And are we going to be willing to say, I'm in 100%. Change the agenda on the songs. Don't worry about the message. I've got something better for you. Amen? This evening I want to, in the rest of our time this evening, I want to talk to you kind of what Miss Christina brought to our attention about who should be our hope. It doesn't take a rock inside just to know that we don't live in the best of times today. 
Uh, I heard a man say one time that everyone's worried about the economy this year. He said, my hairline is in recession, my waistline is in inflation, and altogether I'm in depression. <laughs> Sounded pretty good. You're right. I mean, now you add, now you add on top of that the, the formula for the babies. I mean, so it's just anything and every day you look, there's something crazy. There's something to do, cause us to throw us into despair. And, and can I tell you, not just people, but Christians. Satan's targeting us to say, to begin to panic and worry and concern about where this world's going. Can I tell you where it's going? The way God wants it to go. That's the way it's going. There's nothing that's cost. God's not up in heaven going, uh-oh, there's no formula? <laughs> oh, geez. Can I tell you, God's not up there doing that. God's got it all taken care of. And he's got the Christian moms, and he's got the moms in his hands. He's not going to let the babies go hungry. He's going to take care of it. But the problem is, is we've got to find out where our hope's at. Where is our hope tonight? So many people put their hope in the things of the world. And we know that that's not going to get any, that's not going to do anything for you. The things of this world is going to fail you. They're going to, they're going to, it's going to leave you hanging, looking for more. The Apostle Paul penned 2 Thessalonians 12, probably less than six months after writing the first letter to them. And the reason he wrote it so quick was to kind of clear up a few of the items that was in the first letter. But really, it was to encourage this young church that was, who were suffering and under so much pressure. He wrote to infuse them with hope. And tonight, I want to infuse us with hope. I want the Word of God to infuse us with hope. Because let me tell you what, Ken, if we don't have Jesus, we don't have hope. Come on. There's only a couple of us, few of us here. Help me, help me tonight. If we don't have Jesus Christ, we don't have hope. Amen. So Paul's writing to this young church who have found themselves in the midst of pressure. But can I say this evening, if we can grasp a hold of what Paul's teaching them and writing to them, if we can grasp that ourselves, can I tell you, your life could change. You ever stressed out? Let me tell you what, if we grasp hope like the way Paul's teaching us to grasp hope, stress would be, would be a little limited. I'm being honest. Your stress would be, would be less because you know why? I'm not tripping out. I'm not worried about where this and that's coming from. Did God not just, did Jesus say, I will take care of your needs? He says that, right? And we say we trust the Lord. So guess what? The Bible says that he is not a man that he should lie. So if, guess what? If he says he's going to take care of my needs, my needs are food, clothing, shelter, and breath. That's my needs. Now, if you have more than that, you're blessed. Come on. You're blessed. So if God's given me my needs and so much more, shouldn't my hope be in him anyway? Can I tell you where you shouldn't have your hope? It shouldn't be in your wallet. <laughs> I ain't got no hope in my wallet. Every time I go, it's empty. <laughs> Can I tell you your hope shouldn't be in relationships? Except for Jesus Christ. People are going to let you down. Your hope shouldn't be in your car. Can I tell you there's going to be a day you're going to go... Dum, 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 dum. Right? Right? Or you're going to be driving down the road, you know? We need to know where our hope is. I want to ask you in, in, in internally in your heart, where's your hope tonight? Okay, now where's your hope when the pressure kicks in? It's easy to hope in Jesus when the sun is shining and the birds are chirping and life is good. You're not fighting with your husband. You're not fighting with your wife. The kids, they're, 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 they're great. Yeah, that hardly ever happens, right? But everything is great. There's no problems in the, biz, in the church of the bi business of the church. There's no problems at work. Everything's great. My hope is in Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And then the clouds start rolling in. 
Then, then the walls start creeping in a little bit. Then you get a phone call that you didn't expect. Or the wife has a bit of an attitude and you guys start sliding on an argument and disagreement. Or, or there's a problem in the household. Then the pressure starts to creep in. Then we, I'm talking to Christians tonight. Then we kind of back up. Well, I hope, finish the sentence. Where does your hope go? Man, I hope I get that raise. Man, I hope the loan works out. Man, I hope my husband or wife figure it out. Church, listen, we had an amazing service this morning. And God is doing an amazing thing. He is trying to get our attention. We, we've got a theme for this year. Less of us and more of Him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And less of us means that sometimes we're going to be pretty uncomfortable to allow God to fit into my heart and my life and my way and my agenda and my schedule. Guess what? I've got to get out of the way. And that makes me uncomfortable because I like to be in control. I like to stay back there. But you know what? If I know the fire is down here, then I'm not being very smart if I want to be closer to God and I stay back there. Motivation makes all the difference. There's a man who found himself in the middle of a, of a pastor with, with an angry bull chasing him. And he was running as fast as he could from this bull. And the, the only form of escape was, was the, he saw a tree in the, in, the, in the distance. And he's running to the tree, but the nearest limb was 10 feet off the ground. And the man ran for it. And he made a tremendous leap at the branch. But he missed it on the way up. But he caught it on the way down. Motivation will make you do things that ain't normal. Motivation, you know, will make you do things that you didn't think were possible. Are we motivated, church, to hope in Jesus Christ in all things? We, we've watered down, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Right? That's so worn down. It's like John 3.16. Listen, the verse hasn't lost its power. The verse hasn't lost its power. But we use it so much, it's become callous, it's become normal, it's become just kind of numb. Can I tell you, I can do all things through Christ whom I put my hope in that strengthens me. See, remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about perspective. Where's your perspective? Where's your hope? Well, I hope my kids and I hope this. I hope Jesus Christ gets involved in every situation in my life. I hope salvation hits the home of my brothers and sisters. I hope salvation hits my parents. I hope salvation, I hope freedom and deliverance falls within the families of, of my life. Before we get into the scripture, there's a couple things briefly I've got to look at. If we look at verses 8 and 9, it says this, that, and it's speaking of Jesus coming back. It says in verse 8, in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. It says they will be punished with an eternal destruction forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. You say, why do you put this in here? Well, let me tell you what, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't have hope in Jesus Christ. You have no hope. You have no hope. This is a non-negotiable -negotiable consequence. There is an eternal, like I talked about this morning, the Lord was reaching out. We talked about it a little bit earlier. The Lord was extending His hand out this morning to the lost, to anybody. As far as He could, He said, I'm, I'm trying to reach, I'm trying to, I'm trying to save you. There is by, there's eternal consequences that occur. Listen, I want you to understand, you hear me. There are eternal consequences when you reject Jesus Christ. Eternal consequences. 
I wish I could erase that from my Bible, but I wish that we, you know, universalism was, was a real thing, but it's not. Let me tell you what, universalism teaches that everyone is saved. That is not true. The Bible is very specific. There's one way to be saved, and it's through Jesus Christ. That's it. And if you hear any other teaching, you get out of that church. See, no one can tamper with the truth. And the truth is that without them, you are, we are lost and we are doomed. We have no, everybody say it, hope. You have no hope. If Jesus Christ is not in your life tonight, you have no hope. I'm sorry, that's, that's as, black, as black and white as I can make it. The only way to heaven is to accept him. And he has that origin of hope. The next thing we see here is it's important for us to look at it. There are two more verses real quick. And in verse 3, I'm kind of bouncing around. I apologize, but I want to make sure we get these first. In verse 3, we read, we can't help but thank God for you. In some of the translations it says, we ought always to thank God for you. In verse 11, he skips down. He says, so we keep on praying for you. Or with this in mind, we constantly pray for you. Both verses here, both, both sections of this, remind us of the pri priority of prayer. This was a repeated theme from the Apostle Paul. He, he reminded us all the times, and in, in, in every letter that you read, he reminded people to pray. Have you ever gone through, and I know we got a lot of ladies in the house, so Ken, help me out here. They start throwing things, help me out. But have, have you ever gone through a day where you haven't talked? I got him. Cricket, cricket. <laughs> got off real quiet, real quick. You haven't gone through a whole day where you ain't said one word. Have you gone through a whole day without saying one word to God? Seriously, come on now. The priority of prayer. There's Preston. Let me tell you what, when the, when, the, when the request went out for prayer for Preston, if you got that prayer request, I'm, 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 I'm hoping and I'm believing that you stopped what you were doing and you prayed. You got a hold of God. And you said, God, your will be done, but in the name of Jesus, bring healing, but most of all, bring salvation. And as we begin to pray... The reports came in. Hey, it's still not looking good, but he asked for prayer. And next thing we know, they've got them wide open, and they've got them working on the heart, and they see things that the doctor even called miraculous. And there he is laying on the, laying on the bed. And what are we doing, church? We're still praying. There's still prayer being offered up. We're not hoping in the doctors. No, but thank God for the doctors. But my hope is not in the doctor. My hope is in the one I'm praying to. The one who's given us the power. The one who's got the power to raise the dead from, from the life. You know, bring them back to life. Something like that. You know what I'm trying to say. I'm getting excited. I'm about to lose it. Church, there is power in prayer and sometimes maybe we don't know what to pray but that's when the Holy Spirit says hey just go ahead and step back I got this amen but if we aren't praying we're missing an awesome awesome opportunity for great power if we didn't come together and I'm not putting us on a shelf please I'm not all glory goes to God Right? But if we didn't respond in prayer, where would Preston be at this moment? Where would loved ones that you've requested prayer for when you call out on the, on the text or, hey, please pray for, you know you're calling out to people who are going to stop what they're doing because they understand the priority of prayer. Church, prayer is a privilege that we need to take seriously. I'm going to say that again. Prayer is a privilege that we have to take seriously. 
Do you understand that we are getting the opportunity to talk with the creator of the universe? You are talking and having a conversation with the one who very created your lungs and gave you the breath to speak. No wonder why my hope shouldn't be in him. Even my grandson agrees. You hear him singing. But keep these two things in mind briefly. And I, wanna, I, wanna, I don't want to rush, but I don't want to be long tonight. But keep these two things in mind while we move into the passage. And we make some discoveries about how to maintain hope in the midst of pressure. How to maintain hope in the midst of pressure. Remember now, again, that when this letter was written uh, in this moment of history, in church history, this, this church was facing the most brutal persecution ever. And we've had Bible studies where we've talked about persecution and, and how we are blessed in this nation. We don't, we don't know what persecution is. Right? We get upset if, if, you know, if, if uh, they tell us to close the door for a few weeks. And, and we should. But I don't see nobody banging down the doors or breaking the windows here tonight telling me I can't preach the word of God. They're not putting me in handcuffs yet, preaching the word, right? We're still blessed in this nation, but there may be a con come a time. But let's take this to an individual level, the pressure that we as individuals go through, the difficulties, the persecution from the enemy, and let's look at the pressure that comes against us. Remember now, this church here, the pressure to bow to Caesar was so prevalent. That's what I mean. It was bow, bow, bow to, to Caesar or, or face consequences. If they refused, they ran the risk of being crucified or tortured. Let me ask you a question. If they came in here tonight and they said, here's your two choices. Denounce Christ and you can go home and have your grilled cheese. Or if you keep saying you hope in this Jesus, we're going to take you to the firing squad. Honestly, you say well, that wouldn't. I'm, I'm asking a very serious question here because just so you know, we may not see it here in America, but they see it in other places. I am so excited. I haven't said anything to anybody yet, but in June, at the end of June, we're going to have a missionary come. His name's Michael. I can't remember his last name. Yeah, that guy. But he's going to come, he's been all over and he ministers in Africa. And it's going to be a great opportunity of ministry for him to let, you, let us know who are here in Little Lompoc, right, of how awesome the opportunity is to minister outside the four walls and what he's been through. Church, we're blessed. We're blessed. But what happens when I'm under pressure in my own life, what, my own family, what, what, how do I find hope in that? And there's four keys I want to look at. We get power under pressure. Excuse me. Power under pressure produces hope. Power under pressure produces hope. Verses 3 and 4. Let's go back to that. Dear brothers and sisters, we can't help but thank God for you because your faith is flourishing and your love for one another is growing. We proudly tell, God other, tell God's other churches about your endurance and your faithfulness in all the persecutions and hardships that you are suffering. And as Paul writes this, he points out something very interesting. He reminds them that their faith is growing, their love is increasing, and they are standing tough. Here's the important part. They're facing it together. How many times have we talked about unity and how important unity is? When one suffers, we all suffer. When, when one goes through a difficult situation, we don't go, well, that's too bad for you. <laughs> Sorry about your luck. No, 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 no. We suffer. When one rejoices, guess what we do? We rejoice with them. There is power in this. If someone were to ask me if I wanted to be described as a person who was growing stronger in my faith and loving others more, I'd have to say yes. Where do I sign up, please? Right? And we can see that happening in this passage, but I want to make sure that you understand 
This is actually happening in this passage. But it's not happening in good times. It's happening in the pressure cooker. It's happening in the difficult times. The, the growing isn't happening when the sun is shining and the bluebirds are chirping. It's when it's pouring down rain. It's when the waves are smashing against the rocks. It's in the difficult moments where we see growth and we see power. And so when we're under pressure, when we're in our trials, when we're in our situations, can I tell you, don't lose hope. Because that's how we're talking about growing in Jesus Christ. That's where you grow. It's in the difficult moments. It's in the valley. Right? When we're having a mountaintop, mountaintop experience with the Lord, it's about celebrating. It's about worship. We're, we're, we're praising God. But it's in that valley where I stub my toe. It's in that valley where I trip on the log and skin my knee. And I grow, don't trip on that log again. Right? And I learn to trust my God in all things. And hope in Him alone. And hope and trust that He is going to get me to the next mountaintop. And sometimes we make great discoveries about God when we weren't expecting to do so. When we're under pressure, when our marriage is, is at the grind and we're going at each other's throat or, or we're struggling with a friend or we've got a life situation happening. This is where we find God like we never would have found God before. He just shows up. When we're under pressure, we're able to see the way God provides and cares for us. And that brings hope. It goes back to that message about perspective. Perspective. If you're focused on yourself, you're never going to get the hope that you need. You're never going to get the the help. You're never going to get the growth that you're looking for because you can't grow within yourself. It's in Jesus. I said this this morning. It takes broken soil to produce a crop. I like that one. You can't just go out there and throw a seed down on the ground and just, hey, it's going to grow. Now, that would be me, and I would probably kill it. But you've got to break that ground up. You've got to bring that freshness up. You've got to break that, and then the crop comes. It takes broken grain to, to, to bring bread. You don't just get grain off the stock or bread off the stock. Oh, look, it's a loaf of bread. That'd be weird. There's a process of breaking. God, break us tonight. Remember I keep talking about being uncomfortable? You ever broken a bone? I've been, thank you Lord, been blessed, I have not. But if you've broken a bone, I think the word uncomfortable kind of fits in here. Right? Being broken, being in the pressure cooker, it's not comfortable. But it's beneficial. (laughs) If I want to become more like Christ, guess what? It's beneficial. And I learned that every time I'm in the pressure cooker, every time that things get difficult, guess what? God gets me through it. I learned my hope is in him. Guess what? Next time I'm in the the next pressure cooker, I've learned he got me through this one. Guess what? He'll get me through this one. And guess what? You know what? Next time I'm in the valley again, guess what? He got me here. He got me here. He got me here. I'm good. Now I'm learning where my hope's at. And we're growing in the pressure cooker. Number two, the process of pressure produces hope. Verse five says this, and God will use the persecution to show his justice and make you worthy of his kingdom for which you are suffering. Other translations read some form of to make you worthy of the kingdom of God. That's a beautiful phrase. Usually we don't think about the fact that God is in the process of doing something in our lives, especially when life is rough. Come on now, listen, am I being wrong or right when I say that? But let me tell you what, when we go through the rough times in our life or, or whatever it is we're going through, we don't go, thank you, Jesus. You know, we're not, that's not the first words out of our mouth. Usually it's, why, God? Right? What, what am I in this for? What did I do to deserve this? Not, God, what are you doing in my life? What are you changing in my life? 
Anything that is important in life is worth the effort. Amen? And important things usually take a lot of effort. Let me tell you what. I loved Penny Long. You know the story. I loved Penny Long when I was 13 years old. I'm married to that woman. Right? It took six years. It took six years to finally date her. Another two and a half to three to finally ask her to be my wife. But there was, let me tell you what, if you know Penny Long, that's a lot of effort. I'd have put a lot of effort into that. <laughs> I still put a lot of effort into that. Let me just put that there. <laughs> but she makes good cookies, so it's all worth it. <laughs> Let me tell you, though, anything that's important, we want to put effort into. Is your Christian walk worth putting effort into? It goes back to everything we were doing this morning. Are you fine being comfortable in that seat? Or are you willing to come down here and get some work done? Are you willing to say, Lord, I, I don't, seriously, in the, in the real realm of things here, God, I'm looking to be different next Sunday morning. And so in order for me to be different next Sunday morning, i got to come and do some work. And Lord, prepare me for the pressure. Prepare me, Lord, for the difficult times that I'm going to... That, listen, not that I'm probably going to go through. Not that I may go through. That I will go through. Especially today. And so we've got to be willing. There's some fishermen that had run into some problems. They were trying to ship the codfish that they caught in the waters and the problem was is if the fish were, were, were shipped frozen they arrived to the market but they lost a lot of their flavor but when the fish if there's and if the fish were shipped live they arrived nasty and mushy and disgusting so neither one neither neither was acceptable for the fishermen to ship the fish across the country and after many different type of possible solutions finally one was tried where it worked and this was very interesting they shipped the fish alive across the country, but they put catfish in the same bins where the codfish was. And the reason for this is that the catfish is a natural enemy of the codfish. So during the entire journey, the fish were swimming for their lives. The end result, they arrived fresh. The pressure made them better. The pressure made them better. I am striving to be like Jesus Christ. I am striving daily to be better as a human being, as a man of God. So the pressure that I go through, the difficult moments that I go through, should be forcing me to my knees. And looking up to the hills from whence come my help. Amen? 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 Number three, peace through pressure produces hope. Peace through pressure. Verse six says this, in his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you. A few verses later, down in 11 and 12, we'll see, we see this. So we keep on praying for you, asking our God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. May he give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. Then the name of the Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way you live, and you will be honored along with him. This is all made possible because of the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, when the pressure is on, I know this sounds weird, but hold on, wait for it. When we're in the pressure cooker, when difficult times have come against us, can I tell you something? We can discover peace. No, I can't, Sean. You don't understand. No, no, no. You can. You've got to change. Remember, we talked about this again. The perspective. Where's my hope? Once I recognize who, where my hope is in, that's where I get my peace. It's the same source. Jesus Christ. He's my hope and he's my peace. He is my comfort. He's my everything. Amen? Amen? It's the peace that reminds us that God is with us. And I know we're in a house of ladies, but God is in charge. Yes. I know I threw that curveball there. It kind of ruined. God is in charge, fellas. Not us. 
You hear me say it all the time. Get out of the driver's seat. The car ride's going to be a lot better. You see, God is very aware of everything that is happening around us. And that vengeance that it, it, if somebody does you wrong, that's a, he's got that taken care of. And we can relax if, when we're being mistreated or, and remember that God will, will balance our books. Amen? It's interesting that there's this uh, British novelist, John Creasy, and he published 564 books. 564 books. And while that library is full of books, it should be noted that the first book that he was not published until he had received, ready for this, 774 rejection slips. John kept every single one of them. And he continued to write. And he would occasionally glance at that stack and remember how much he believed in what he had written. And years later he said, he would say this, I always knew they were wrong. How would you like to look at the enemy right face to face and say, I always knew you were wrong? Come on now. Come on now. How, how, how awesome would that be? I mean, you come into church one Sunday morning, you just got a pep in your step. Guess what I just told the devil? I knew he was wrong. I knew the church, the devil was wrong. He thought he could flatten you down like a pancake and look at you praising God. Look at where you found your hope. And as the pressure starts to build, it's important, church, to trust God for the peace that enduring that pressure. You think the devil is just going to sit by while you're struggling and having a hard time and just go, oh, it's okay. We'll just, you're going to be okay again. No, he's going to keep pouring it on like a salt in a wound. That's he's going to keep on going. He's going to keep. So I need something that I can grasp a hold of to get me through that difficult moment. And don't tell me to read the Bible. And don't tell me to pray. No, I'm telling you to read the Bible. I'm telling you to pray and get soaked in and dig in and get a hold of the hope that's within you. His name's Jesus if you need to know. We can and we will survive. And finally this morning, the promise after the pressure produces hope. And this is good news for every single person in here. If you've got a relationship with Jesus Christ, if he's living in your heart today, this is good news. Verse 10, we find these words. When he comes on that day. <laughs> Everybody say that day. When he comes on that day. Cam will tell you what. If you and me are standing next together on that day, boy, we're just going to do high fives all the way up. <laughs> on that day. He will receive glory from his holy people. Praise from all who believe. And this includes you. For you believed what we told you about him. This includes you because you believed our testimony. I realize in that hearing that there is hope to be discovered in the middle of pressure might not be very exciting to us. Right, can I just get the hope without the hurt? Can I, can I possibly get the hope without being crushed? Can, can I get some hope without being in the pressure cooker? No, because that's where my hope grows. That's where my life grows. That's where my strength grows in the Lord. Many would say, well, you know what? <laughs> I don't want to find hope. I just want the pressure to end. There's a lot of people like that. I don't want to go through the toughness. Can I be cool just coming to church on Sunday mornings? I know I keep going back to that church, but God is tired of normal. He's tired of it. Normal ain't got nobody nowhere. You know what? When we get to understand where our hope's at in the pressure, you don't think Peter didn't feel pressure after he preached the sermon and 3,000 people were grown in the church? In a few chapters, the church felt the pressure. And what happened? They continued to grow. Persecution didn't stop them. The pressure cooker didn't stop them. They grew. And that's what makes this point it's so exciting. At some point, the pressure really does end. All the garbage going on out in the world today, it's going to be coming to an end. 
We ain't going to have to worry. Listen, let me tell you what. The babies ain't going to have to worry about formula. Christians ain't going to have to worry about Roe versus Wade. We ain't going to have to worry about none of this garbage. Because we're not even going to be here. And so there is at one point, the pressure does end. And the great thing about a believer, whoo, the great thing about being a Christian, the great thing knowing where I put my hope today is knowing that when I get up there, oh, I'm dancing around the throne saying, thank, thank you, Lord, for being my hope. Thank you, Lord, for the pressure times. Thank you for the times that were difficult. Yes, they were difficult, but you never left me. You never forsook me. You never let me break, Lord God, because you were there the whole time. Let me tell you what. The hope that allows, the, that hope allows us to face life every day, knowing that God is in control, knowing that soon and very soon, Alyssa, you're leading worship in heaven. Come on now. Soon and very soon, Carlina, you're going to be doing some kind of book kind of keeping up in heaven. Some kind of word study. And knowing that tomorrow when Monday comes up and the alarm clock goes off and I go, oh, Lord, it's Monday. The pressure cooker lid gets put on top and the difficulties of the day begin. Guess what? I've got a hope. I've got a hope that allows me to face every situation that will come against me until the day that I stand face to face with my Savior. I got a hope that allows me the freedom to become all that God has called me to be. I don't care if you've lived most of your life and you're just now finally getting to the fact that my life doesn't really matter. I want what God's got for me. Can I tell you, there's a freedom because you have a hope. And that hope allows the freedom to become anything that God has called us to be. And that hope restores meaning and purpose from the rubble of shattered lives. It doesn't matter what your past looks like. God says, hey, you hope in me? All is well. I'm gonna put those, I'm gonna put those rocks back together for you. And I'm gonna make who I like how this verse says, I'm making a masterpiece out of you. You're God's masterpiece. I love that. I love that. And I can put my hope in that list and know that all is well. Even if all is well. Even if I will hope in the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords, I will hope. Listen, if you would. In closing this evening, Monday is coming. <laughs> the pressure cooker is coming. You may be in it at this moment. But you do not have to face problems or pain or pressure alone this evening. Or ever again. Church, ever again. We, we don't have to. And don't let the devil lie to you and say you do. The one who created us and loves us and gave his life for us and is alive today with us through every situation. He's with us tonight. And he says, I just want to remind you something. In case you have forgot, I'm still victorious. I've never lost a battle, and I'm not starting today, and I'm not starting tomorrow, and I'm not starting next week. Oh, and by the way, I never lose. So let the pressure come. What? No, shh, don't say that. No, no, let the pressure come. Because, Ray, I want to be more like Jesus Christ. And I can't be more like Jesus if the pressure cooker and the difficult times don't, don't come into my life. But in those moments, let me hold to the hope that I've never held to so strong before and know that he's going to get me through that difficulty. And out of that difficulty, I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to be wiser. And you know what? There's going to be a little le less of Sean and a little bit more of Jesus. There was once a man who who wanted to play in the Imperial Orchestra. But he, he didn't even know how to play an instrument. He couldn't play a note. 
his musical ability was non-existent. And, but however, he was a person of great wealth and influence. So he demanded to join. And his hope was that one day he would be able to play in front of a, the king himself. So the conductor reluctantly agreed. Put some money in his back pocket and said, okay, whatever. You can join the orchestra. And he let him sit on the second row of the orchestra. And the man was given a flute to play. And <laughs> although the man knew nothing about music, he, he'd raise the flute and he'd pucker his lip and move his fingers around and make it look like he was playing. But never made a sound. There was a few in the orchestra that knew about the deception. But in large, the sound of the entire orchestra, the plan seemed to work. And the scam went on for two or three years, and then a new conductor came in to direct the orchestra. And the new conductor told them that he would hold auditions to see how well each player could play. He warned that his standards were high, and if, he could not, if they could not meet his standards, then they were going to be cut and kicked out of the orchestra. As you might imagine, this terrified fake flute player started to panic. And this new conductor had a reputation for excellence and, wealth, and the wealthy fraud was not going to be able to influence this new guy. So there was an audition, a private audition that was set for him. And on the day it was to happen, the false flutist faked being sick. Oh, I'm sick. I, I can't make it. So the audition was canceled and was rescheduled. And the same sickness saved him again for the next planned audition. Finally, after faking sick twice, the man had to face the music. And he did not know what to do. So he went to the audition and he played two notes of music. <laughs> And the conductor said, get out of here. Get on. And he was immediately removed from the orchestra. And this is where we get the expression, face the music. <laughs> and often, oftentimes in life, we find ourselves in situations where we don't know what to do. Many times. Amen? And the circumstances of life have... They swirl out of control, and, and sometimes the pressure is overwhelming. But the promise of God is that in those moments of pressure, in those moments of de de degree of difficulty, He does what needs to be done. And if I could say anything tonight to encourage you, God already knows what's going to happen anyway. Why are we stressing? Why we worry? Jesus knew what was going to happen, and he struggled even. So of course we're going to struggle. But if we would learn and where our hope is at, it would help. It would help, church. Again, he will not leave us alone. He will not forget us. And he will take care of our needs. The pressure that we go through, again, as I mentioned earlier, it shouldn't cause us to panic. It shouldn't cause us to, to freak out. It should cause us to hit our knees and to find our perspective and our hope in Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, the very one who has us, and that we would find hope by trusting, listen, trusting God's ways above our ways. Amen? Amen. There, that, that's the secret. Trusting God's ways over our ways. Right. And knowing that through this difficult time, we are becoming again less of ourselves and more like Him. God will stand with us and we will never have to face the music alone. He's always with us. Amen? I don't know about you, but this encourages me. This, this gives me hope. Amen? This gives me, guess what, Ken? I can wake up tomorrow morning on Monday morning and say, thank you, Jesus, for Monday. Because I've got hope. I know where my hope lies this evening and every day forth. 
Yes, when the times get difficult, I'll still say, even if it rains and pours, my hope will be in Him. Amen. Amen? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that I never have to face the music alone. God, I never have to go through anything. Lord, the security I have, Lord, in you brings me hope. Lord God, the, the hope, you are the hope. You are my precious gift of hope, Lord God. And Lord, I know that, that some may be in the pressure cooker this moment. God, would you just touch their hearts and say, hey, I'm here. Put your hope in me. Don't put your hope in a situation. Don't put your hope in a bank account. Don't put your hope in something the world can try to give you. Put your hope, complete hope and trust in me tonight. And I, during the pressure cooker, will cause you to grow like you've never grown before. <laughs> God, we want to grow in you. We want to become less of ourselves and become more like you each and every moment of each and every day. And I am asking in the name of Jesus that you would bring this message back each and every time the difficult times begin to creep up, Lord God. Let us not, be, let us not stress out and worry anymore. You've called us not to be anxious. Be anxious for nothing but pray about everything. So God, let the power, the priority of prayer begin to sink into our hearts because there is power in prayer. Father God, I just ask that you would reignite our hearts this evening. That you'd realign our hearts to find where my hope is tonight. In the good times, in the bad times, and even if, God, my hope will be in you. We give you honor and we give you praise in these closing moments of this service. I want to thank you, Lord, for the service this morning. God, let that not be a one-off time or situation, but God, let that be a beginning time of breaking. Lord, we are calling out to you to break us, Lord God. Break us of ourselves. Lord, if some of us are on the potter's wheel and we need to be smashed so that you might mold us into that which you called us and purposed us to do, God, do that to even beginning tonight. But we are coming together in one mind and one accord saying, God, fill this place with your presence, Lord God. And send us, Father, and use us as you will. God, we don't want to play church anymore. Father, we want to we wanna live. We want Jesus Christ to live in us and through us. And we want the world to know who we are in Jesus Christ. We are children of the living God. And we have victory tonight. And I have hope tonight. I've got joy tonight. I've got peace tonight. I've got comfort tonight. I've got wisdom tonight. I've got everything I need tonight because, Lord, you are alive and well tonight. And I thank you for the very victory, Lord God, that I walk in this moment. Be my hope. Be my hope in difficult situations. And let me not forget it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. Church, God bless. Have a blessed week. Let us go forth and just let the Lord use us where he wants to use us. And let us remember where our hope is. Amen? Amen. God bless, church.